So if you have a Bible, open it to the book of Amos. Just a brief few thoughts to consider from Amos uh, 4 and 5. If you need a Bible, if you slip up your hand, uh, Pastor Dave will get one into that hand so that you can follow along with us in our study this morning. Amos, Old Testament, one of the skinnier books, so you could uh, blow right by it as you're leaping through. But uh, book of Amos, and we continue our study in chapter 4. Amos chapter 4 begins this way. Verse 1, he says, Hear this word, you cows of Bashan, who are on the mountains of Samaria, who oppress the poor, who crush the needy, who say to your husbands, Bring wine, let us drink. The Lord God is sworn by his holiness. Behold, the day shall come upon you, and he will take you away with his fish hooks, and your posterity with fish hooks, and you will go out through broken walls, each one straight ahead of her. And you will be cast into Harmon, says the Lord. As we continue through the book of Amos and through uh, the prophets that we have been studying, it's important to remember what the context of this is. Amos is preaching uh, down in Judah, the southern kingdom, just before the time when the northern kingdom of Israel was overrun by God's judgment by the Assyrians. The northern kingdom had been evil from its inception, from its split from the southern kingdom of Judah where Jerusalem was. And they'd set up idols and idolatry and had kings that were bad or really bad or really, really, really bad. And the people did not have a heart for God, but they made up their own religion. And Amos is warning them along the way, just as the prophets that we have studied up to this point had warned both of the kingdoms. And in this one, Amos, the prophet, says something that, well, if I had used these words this morning, it wouldn't be an encouragement to come back to church next week. Because essentially what he said was to all of the uh, noble women of the northern kingdom, hey, you cows, judgment is coming. Now, he wasn't saying they were unattractive or overweight. He was saying that they were like cows feeding on the poor and the needy of the land and just getting fattened up for their pleasure. Verse 4 says, Come to Bethel and transgress. At Gilgal, multiply transgression. Bring your sacrifices every morning, your tithes every three days. Offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving with leaven. Proclaim and announce the free will offerings. For this you love, you children of Israel, says the Lord God. Now that's kind of strange. He says, all right, come on up to Bethel, come on up to Gilgal, and offer sacrifices, and offer thanksgiving sacrifices with leaven. Wait a minute. Wait a minute, leaven, that's bad in sacrifices, right? So forth? Absolutely. And there's something that we can miss here. Bethel means house of God. And if you look back in Genesis, you find that Bethel was the place where Abraham encountered God and heard the promises of God. Bethel is a place where Jacob encountered God. God and set up an altar there and is the place where in, later in his life Jacob went and resided there because it was the place where he had encountered God. Gilgal is the place where Joshua and the whole nation, all 12 tribes of Israel, first encamped when they came into the land, the promised land, after the wandering in the wilderness and now the Lord says, now is the time. Cross the Jordan. Go in and take hold of what I have given and promised you. Walk in my promises. That's the first place they encamped. It's also the place where King Saul was first crowned king and declared king. But both had become centers of Israel's idolatry. There were altars and worship temples to other gods that had been set up in these two places. The very places that represented to the nation 
where they had first encountered God, where they'd first been introduced to Him, and where they had first stepped out to live in the promises of God. In verses 6 through the beginning of chapter 5, the Lord says again and again, hey, I tried to get your attention. Look at what he says. I gave you cleanness of teeth in all your cities. Now, the Lord is not speaking like a good dentist, okay? What he's saying is, I took your food away from you. Your teeth are clean because you have no food to eat. That's what he's saying there. And lack of bread in all your places, yet... You've not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you when there were still three months to the harvest. I made it rain on one city. I would withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water. They were not satisfied, yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, and your olive trees, the locusts devoured them. Yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come into your nostrils. Yet you've not returned to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah. And you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning. Yet... You have not returned to me, says the Lord. Therefore, thus will I do to you, O Israel, because I will do this to you. Prepare to meet your God, O Israel. For behold, he who forms mountains and creates the wind, who declares to man what his thought is and makes the morning darkness, who treads the high places of the earth, the Lord God of hosts is his name. Hear this word which I take up against you. A lamentation, O house of Israel, the virgin of Israel has fallen. She will rise no more. She lies forsaken on her land. There is no one to raise her up. For thus says the Lord God, The city that goes out by a thousand shall have a hundred left. And that which goes out by a hundred shall have ten left to the house of Israel. Again and again, the Lord says, I tried to get your attention, but you did not return to me. We spoke a little bit about this last week. We could spend months talking about and trying to sort through the theology of why do bad things happen to good people? Some of the people that I know who are the strongest in faith in the Lord have gone through excruciating trials. And it blows wide open the whole concept that was blown wide open in the book of Job, which is if you're good, good things will happen to you all the time. And if you're bad... Bad things will happen to you, and if bad things happen to you, then you must have done something bad, and if good things happen to you, you must be good. It blows it wide open. It isn't that simple, and yet we live in it, even in this day. You ever had this conversation? Talking about uh, some well-known, very rich, very famous person, and how, man, they they... they they do this wrong, they do that. I can't believe they do that. But you know they are rich. But you know they are. Have you ever had that conversation? Maybe even about someone that you know. And it's like, man, they, they just, they, 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 don't, they're, they don't understand God. They don't live according to His principles. But you know they are rich. As if to say, somehow that is a little check mark to say, so they must be doing something right. Nuh-uh. Nuh-uh. The Lord God Almighty stepped down out of heaven. The one worthy of every created thing, worshiping and bowing down. And he came to this earth and was born in a barn and laid in a feeding trough as a crib. Lived a nondescript life with a poor family in the outskirts of a very small nation, an inconsequential nation. 
He said to his disciples, the birds have nests, the foxes have holes, the Son of Man doesn't even have a place to lay down his head. He gave and gave, and what he received was not praise and adoration as the creation, all creation, should and will do. But instead he received the scorn from those who were most equipped intellectually to know who he was and why he came. So why do we have the concept that, well, if I do good, it's all going to be good. It's all going to be gravy. It's going to be all downhill, buddy. It's not the way it's built. It's not that simple. And sometimes the difficulties that come into our lives, whether they are self-imposed or God-imposed or just happened, we can miss the opportunity for God's mighty work in our hearts and lives by spending so much time trying to figure out why is this happening to me instead of returning to the Lord in the midst of it and saying, Lord, what would you have me to do in the midst of this? And again and again, the Lord says, hey, this happened, that happened. I let it not rain here and it rained over there. I let this happen. I let that happen. And you didn't return to me. Instead, you went from the city where there was no rain and you went somewhere else where there was water. You went everywhere else but to me. You didn't return to me. And so I will bring this judgment. But look at what it says in verse 4 of chapter 5. For thus says the Lord to the house of Israel, Seek me and live. But do not seek Bethel, nor enter Gilgal, nor pass over to Beersheba, for Gilgal shall surely go into captivity, and Bethel shall come to nothing. Seek the Lord and live lest he break out like a fire in the house of Joseph and devour it, with no one to quench it in Bethel, you who turn justice to wormwood or poison and lay righteousness to rest in the earth. Seek me, he says, and live. Again, he brings up Bethel and Gilgal, and I believe that there's more to it than just the fact that they had taken these two cities and had brought idolatry into the midst of them because of what they represent to Israel. And what every Israelite would have understood they represent in the history of Israel. And this, my friend, to me, is the connection to us. I would suspect that most of you don't have a little city that you got, go to where you have set up an altar and there's, there's a statue that you've carved of a woman and you go there and you offer bulls and goats and birds and dogs and cats on the altar there. I suspect that's not true for anyone in this room. If it is, let's talk after the service, okay? But you know, sometimes, and what these represent, these represented the first encounters with God, the place of the first encounter. Bethel for Abraham and for Jacob. Establishing of the, of the tribes and, and, and the, the, what would become the nation of Israel. Gilgal in the encampment and stepping into the promises of God. And sometimes in our lives, when difficult things start to happen, after we run off here and there and check out what Dr. Oz says or what this book says or whatever, then the next thing we do is, okay, i gotta get, I got to get back to the Lord. And so we go back to the places where we began in a bad way. We say, well, if I just do it this way again, it'll all work. As if it's a formula. I have a degree in chemistry. And I learned in doing 
various experiments that, you know what? If the particular conditions are the same, you can expect the same result. If, as I did, you decide that instead of using a steam bath to heat up a column of methanol, you use a Bunsen burner with an open flame, you will get a fireball about this big, fortunately underneath the lab hood. It was pretty exciting. <laughs> and I could do it again. If Pitt would let me into the Chevron building, which they probably won't anymore. But it's not the same for our lives. If I decided the best thing for me to do to get back to the purity of my childhood was to start wearing diapers and drinking out of a bottle with a nipple on it, you all think I'd lost my mind. And yet sometimes it's almost what we do. I want to return to where it was. I want to build that formula again. God wants to bring you on. Yes, we build the altars just like the Old Testament patriarchs did. Of God met me here, and I remember that, and those are testimonies to God's meeting us. But they're not a place to go back to and dwell forever. For God is leading us on so that we will no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, so that we will grow up in all things unto Him who is the head, so that we will grow in the unity of the Spirit, in the bond of peace, into a complete person. God wants to carry us on. God wants to pull us and entreat us and equip us to get to the place where he wants us to be. Verse 14, Amos says this. It's an evil time. Seek good and not evil, that you may live, so that the Lord God of hosts will be with you as you have spoken. Evidently, they had an expression the Lord God is with me. The Lord God be with you. A blessing or a statement of faith. He says, seek me and that'll be true. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. They were standing on the precipice of God's judgment being poured out on them, which had been prophesied for hundreds of years because of their rebellion. And so the prophet says, look, return to the Lord. Perhaps he will be gracious. He was speaking to a nation, speaking to a called people in a unique situation. But he says the same thing to us this day on a personal level. Seek me and live. Don't seek what the world has to offer. Don't seek the wisdom of this world. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and therein he meditates day and night. He's going to be like a tree planted by the river. The one who is living in the counsel of the ungodly will be like the chaff that just a light breeze will blow away. Established. God may establish you in the midst of turmoil. God may have chosen a path for you that includes suffering. Scripture does, as I recall, say something about... Uh, Everybody's got to suffer to get into the kingdom of God. Uh, something like that. 
Yeah. This life is not intended to be comfortable. This life is intended to cause us to grow closer to the Lord and to know the truth, Christian. The truth of the matter is, no matter what the situation, no matter what circumstance you find yourself in the midst of, if your heart and life are hidden in Christ, whether you are on the top of the mountain or in the valley of the shadow of death, He is with you and He will give you the strength while well, Paul and Silas, after being bitten, beaten and thrown into prison, were singing songs. We're singing songs in the middle of the night. And when the angel of the Lord freed them, they didn't run out screaming to get out of town, but stayed sitting there so that the jailer wouldn't kill himself, would get saved and his whole household and be one of the establishments of the church at Philippi. Awesome. The Christian life is an interesting, exciting journey. And every one of our paths is determined to be different. For God has chosen you and you and you and everyone in this room for good works, which He appointed before He created this earth. And He created you for those good works. And He is continuing to create you in Him for those good works. Walk with Him. Let Him lead you in those good works. Seek Him. Not the thing, not the person, not the old way, not just the new way. We've got to find the new way. Seek Him. And in whatever way He chooses, He will use you in just awesome ways and you will live. Because you see, God in Christ said, I have come that you might have life and that you might have a whole lot of it, abundant life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your promises. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this encouragement to seek you, to not seek the things of this life, or to try and walk backwards to where we once were. But Lord, help us to seek you and in that move forward to the things that you have ordained for us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to hearts here this morning. Lord, give specifics reminders of the things that we know you have called us to, that you have spoken to our hearts in the past. Remind us of those things that we might be encouraged to move forward in you, to seek you. For your promise is if we seek you, we will find you. Now may the Lord God Almighty richly bless and keep you. May He make His face to shine upon you and grant you peace. May He lift up His countenance upon you and be gracious unto you each and every day of your life. Through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord, our Savior, and our soon-coming King. Amen. Amen. God bless you.